Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Graham, MSP, and as Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to welcome you all here today for this very special event celebrating Human Rights Day. 2018 is a significant year for human rights. Nelson Mandela once said, to deny people their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. A thought-provoking remark, as we reflect upon the past and acknowledge the 70th anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Following the horrific acts of inhumanity during the Second World War, this milestone document set out to achieve a common standard for all people and all countries to ensure our fundamental human rights are universally protected. However, this is not the only anniversary we are acknowledging today. This year, 2018, is the 20th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders. And I'm pleased to say we'll be hearing today from some human rights defenders on the work they are doing. The Human Rights Act 1998, which brings articles of the European Convention on Human Rights into UK law. The Scotland Act 1998, particularly important for this establishment, as well as being the Act which established the Scottish Parliament. The Scotland Act 1998 ensures that any bills we pass are compatible with ECHR and EU law. And finally, 2018 marks the 10th anniversary of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, a Scottish Parliament supported body, which was established a decade ago on the 10th of December 2008. And we'll hear shortly on, of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. 2018 is also the year of young people. And I'm pleased to say there'll be plenty of young voices being heard throughout the event today. There are many reasons to mark this day in Parliament. First of all, it's your Parliament and the democratic heart of Scotland. Also, for the last 18 months, there has been a particular focus on human rights in the Scottish Parliament. This increased activity began with the report from the Presiding Officer's Commission on Parliamentary Reform in June 2017. The Commission received submissions from the Scottish Human Rights Commission and civic society groups calling for the Parliament to have a strengthened role in the promotion and protection of human rights in Scotland and to become a guarantor of human rights. Recognising the importance and complexity of the involved issues, the POR's Commission recommended that the Qualities and Human Rights Committee consider these issues as part of its inquiry work. The Committee undertook this inquiry into human rights and the Scottish Parliament, and the report that came out of this inquiry was published very recently on 26 November. I'm sure the convener of the Committee, who's here, will speak more about the recommendations shortly. Throughout the inquiry, several new relationships were forged by the Committee with the United Nations and the European Human Rights Institutions. And I'm pleased to say that we will also hear this morning video contributions from those bodies. I understand the Committee also listened to a number of people through its focus groups, individuals, and those who provided advocacy services for people trying to access their rights. It's great to see many of the participants here today we welcome you and encourage you to continue your involvement with this Parliament. For almost two decades, the Scottish Parliament has demonstrated its commitment to human rights, a commitment that was written in our founding principles. Over the years, we've also seen the creation of the Children's Commissioner and the Scottish Human Rights Commission. More recently, the Parliament added human rights to the remit of the Equalities Committee. Recent parliamentary activity on human rights includes a Scottish Government debate on human rights defenders on 26 September, and a visit from the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights in November. And the purpose of this event today is to look at what progress has been made in Scotland to promote and protect human rights. Today, human rights will, as rightly, take over this Parliament. So we'll be hearing from Ruth Maguire, MSP, Convener of Equalities and Human Rights Committee on its recent report into human rights and the Scottish Parliament. Judith Robertson, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Bianca Jagger, Founder, President and Chief Executive of the Bianca Jagger Human Rights Foundation. Goodwill Ambassador for the Council of Europe, Senior Fellow. 
Centre for International Governance Innovation and a member of the Executive Director's Leadership Council of Amnesty International USA. Members of the Children's Parliament and the Scottish Youth, Youth Parliament on Human Rights for Children and Young People and Defending Human Rights. Young people from Oban High School and Hangland High School who will be reading poems they wrote for the day. And not last or least, the Right Honourable, Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP, First Minister of Scotland. Now, since there's a lot to get through, I'll conclude my remarks by once again welcoming you all to this very special event, by asking those of you joining online to be part of the conversation too, by using the hashtag, hope I get this right because I don't know how to do it, hashtag rights take over, I think that's how you say it, on Twitter. I hope you all find this thought-provoking and an enjoyable day, and I thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I'd like to invite Ruth Maguire, convener of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, to open this morning's event. Convener. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to you for hosting this event, which I know will be a lively and interesting day full of discussion and debate. Today is an opportunity to celebrate the rights work taking place in Scotland, a day to celebrate all your efforts as human rights defenders. Whatever walk of life we come from, whatever daily challenges we face, we can make a difference by being human rights champions. Whether this is in our place of work, study, community or online, we can make a difference. The 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a call to commit to speaking out and standing up for the human rights of others. We are asked as individuals by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to pledge, I will respect your rights regardless of who you are. I will uphold your rights even when I disagree with you. When anyone's human rights are denied, everyone's rights are undermined, so I will stand up. I will raise my voice, I will take action, I will use my rights to stand up for your rights. As the closest representatives of the people, parliamentarians have an added responsibility. We must use our position to champion meaningful human rights change. Scotland still faces challenges. We have an obligation to ensure people's rights are protected and fulfilled and to ensure an end to discrimination. The Equalities and Human Rights Committee conducted an inquiry into how the Scottish Parliament could strengthen its approach to human rights and become a guarantor of human rights. Our recent report, Getting Rights Right, is the culmination of nearly two years of exploration, research, speaking and listening to a diverse range of people. The committee heard from many people, including those who have suffered from mental health issues, academics, international experts and primary school human rights defenders. Before I say a little about our recommendation, I'd like to express the committee's sincere and heartfelt thanks to those who shared their life experience with us. Your personal stories demonstrate why a greater focus on human rights is needed. It's essential that the Parliament continues to look at ways to strengthen its human rights role, and we couldn't do that without all of you. Thank you. <laughs> We've been open-minded in our approach and willing to learn. Our report sets out that learning in the form of a roadmap to guide the Parliament in the coming decade. Achieving the goals that we've set out will make it easier to identify when people's rights are being violated, where there is a deterioration of rights, and really importantly, where there are opportunities to advance human rights. As well as becoming a global leader, the Parliament will become a vital role model to other public bodies, helping to drive forward a culture of change that gives human rights a greater priority. We hope that everyone will have increased confidence in dealing with human rights issues and individuals will feel more able to raise their human rights concerns. With everyone's help, we can build a greater awareness of human rights across Scotland and the positive impact that human rights can have on all our lives. As Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland put so beautifully in their submission to us, human rights remind us that we're working with people and their lives, not just a condition, 
not a policy, not a statistic, not a problem to be solved. They matter because they protect us from the worst that we can do to one another and highlight the joy and positive impact we can have. Human rights illuminate the respect and humanity we can show each other. The committee have made 40 detailed recommendations which seek to put human rights at the heart of what we do by looking at promoting and protecting human rights when we deal with legislation, ensuring international human rights obligations are implemented, ensuring adequate funding for the effective protection of human rights through our parliament budget process, scrutinising the government's performance of its human rights obligations and raising awareness of human rights issues in Scotland. On the last of these points, I hope that those following on social media today and those in the public gallery will help spread the word that we must make human rights a reality for everyone. I'd like to focus on a couple of key areas of our inquiry that we consider have the greatest potential to bring about change over the short term. Most of our attention has been on the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act, rightly so because the Scotland Act, which establishes the Parliament, ensures that any legislation must be compatible with the Convention as well as EU law. But should Scotland be taken out of the EU, we will lose some European protections. Many of our recommendations, therefore, unite around making better use of the international rights framework and how we deal with legislation. Showing leadership in human rights, being a champion for human rights, is a key theme in our report particularly when focusing on our international obligations. The Universal Periodic Review and the other international treaty monitoring processes are a framework that the Parliament can harness to show where Scotland can do better. As a committee, we've committed to engaging more directly with the United Nations, ensuring our reports are made available to them, and speaking with UN Special Rapporteurs and UN Committees. We will also ensure regular parliamentary debates are held to support wider parliamentary discussion about our human rights progress. The committee has called on the Scottish Government and other public sector funders to provide resources to civic society organisations so they can engage with the United Nations treaty monitoring process to improve accountability. Also, we recommend an online Scottish public resource should be created where we can all track Scotland's progress against its human rights obligations. We look forward to working with the Scottish Government and the Scottish Human Rights Commission on this initiative. A core function of our Parliament is to scrutinise legislation. Our recommendations would increase the availability of human rights information through the provision of a human rights memorandum. This will assist members and the public in understanding human rights implications of any piece of legislation and, importantly, where there are opportunities to advance human rights. We have also asked that the human rights are flagged when we come to amend a bill. These recommendations, coupled with increased training on human rights for members and further work on what human rights-based approach to scrutiny will look like in practice, will help further cement human rights principles in the Parliament. I see that I am running out of time, so let me just conclude quickly by thanking you all for coming along. I hope you have a very enjoyable day and that you continue to share your passion for human rights with us for a long time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I will now hear from Judith Robertson, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, with previous leadership roles, including Programme Director of CME and Head of Oxfam in Scotland. Judith has had a long-standing involvement in social justice campaigning and advocating for the rights of many disadvantaged groups. Judith Robertson, please. It's a great honour and privilege to be here today, so thank you very much for the invitation. Today, as we've heard, is undoubtedly a very significant day for human rights. All around the world, countries are marking the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the bedrock of the global system for the protection of rights. Here in the UK, we also mark the 20th anniversary of the Human Rights Act and the Scotland Act, which together embed rights into our laws and public institutions. And today, as we've heard, also marks the 10th anniversary of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, of which I am the chair. Established by this parliament as an independent body, 
charged with promoting and protecting human rights for everyone in Scotland and to be a bridge between the international protection, international system of rights protections and Scotland. So today it's a time to mark and celebrate progress, a time to remind ourselves of the importance of the rights we all have by virtue of our equal status and equal worth as human beings. Rights enshrined in law to ensure that we can all live free from oppression in all its forms. Free to live dignified lives where we can all flourish and fulfil our potential, both individually and collectively. It's also a time to recognise the progress we have made in securing people's rights by sharing ideas, challenging decisions, scrutinising and revisiting laws and policies, and by working together on solutions to improve people's lives. Over the last 70 years, progress has undeniably been made locally, nationally and globally to cement rights into the fabric of our societies and world order. Infrastructures have been built up at the United Nations, in regional courts, such as the European Court of Human Rights, in the development of national laws and Bill of Rights, in national human rights institutions and civil society, all acting as human rights defenders. But we must not forget that people here in Scotland and around the world continue to experience human rights violations on a daily basis. We still face grave challenges. After a decade of work, it is clear to us at the Commission that too often people's rights are not fully realised in everyday life in Scotland. Parents choosing between heating their homes or feeding their children. People unable to access mental health services when they need them most. Disabled people still facing barriers to accessing basic services violence against women and girls. Too many people unable to access advice or representation when things go wrong. These and many more challenges have been accompanied in the UK and indeed beyond internationally with a worryingly negative rhetoric around rights. Too many states are failing to acknowledge and uphold their international legal obligations to respect, protect and fulfil people's rights first set out in the Universal Declaration 70 years ago today. And too many states are forgetting the lessons of history and turning their backs on the international rule of law and collective action to respond to global issues. In Scotland in 2018, the situation is somewhat different. When I work with our sister, our sister national human rights institutions around the world, I am reminded we are fortunate indeed to have a government and a parliament in Scotland who consider rights as core business. Increasingly, we have seen human rights being used to frame policies, strategies and outcomes within government and a range of public bodies. Rights are becoming better understood as more than a compliance duty, but as a useful practical framework for addressing issues such as climate change, poverty and inequalities. We have an Equality and Human Rights Committee with a vision and a plan to realise this Parliament's role as a guarantor of human rights and our First Minister has sought out the independent advice of an expert group on the steps needed for human rights leadership on economic, social and environmental rights in the context of Brexit. But my key message to all of us today is this. Human rights are first and foremost for people, not governments. And where there are rights, there are corresponding obligations, and for these obligations, there must be accountability. Human rights law developed as a way of holding states to account for their responsibilities, to ensure we all have the freedoms and conditions we need to be human and to thrive. Rights can give people power. Uh, rights can give power to people's claims to be treated with fairness and dignity. It can be transformative when governments and public bodies explicitly recognise people's rights and their own legal obligations to respect protect and fulfil them. For example, recognising social security as a human right removes paternalistic or philanthropic connotations and stigma. However, if advancing human rights stays predominantly within the domain of those with power and policy makers, there is a danger that people become detached from them. We need to firmly root rights where they belong, with people themselves, theirs to own and claim theirs to seek redress and remedy for when things go wrong. So we look ahead to the next chapter in Scotland's human rights journey, we face a twofold challenge. First, to make sure that people know, understand and value their human rights. To get to a place where rights are truly owned in people's hearts and minds as belonging to everyone. 
and where rights are claimed with confidence by people across the country, in their communities, in care homes, in prisons, hospitals and workplaces. And second, to sharpen the hard edge of accountability for all rights, so that rights are real in practice for people. Going beyond the reuse of rights as a guiding principle or as a general approach to making laws and policies, establishing a broader set of concrete legal standards, building on those that already exist, that people can use to hold government and public bodies to account. Enabling human rights to do what they're meant to do, balancing power between people and the state in all its forms. This morning, the First Minister formally received the recommendations of our advisory group on human rights leadership, which are made in this vein. They are significant and bold. Our hope as a, as a Commission is that we can all unite behind a vision of a Scotland with a full range of rights, civil, political, economic, social, cultural and environmental, are embedded in our culture and our laws. This will mean working together, all of us, for example, through Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights, to maintain a healthy balance across society of putting rights into practice, promoting their value for everyone and securing accountability when they're not realised. Today, we come together here in Scotland's Parliament to reflect on progress, progress made and the distance still to travel in Scotland's human rights journey. 70 years ago, in 1948, the drafters of the Universal Declaration could never have imagined some of the challenges and changes we now face globally. Climate change, the pace of technological change, globalisation and privatisation. Some challenges, however, would be all too familiar. The demonisation of people perceived to be other, extremism, the pursuit of narrow self-interest, poverty and inequality. We must now face these and other challenges head on. We must show collective leadership, and I would like to quote, close by quoting one of the contributors to a series of short films the Commission has made to mark today's anniversaries. Dr Donald McCaskill, whom you'll be hearing from later, Chief Executive of Scottish Care, put it well when he said, human rights at their best hold a mirror in front of us to a world and a humanity which we need to become and which we grow into. We look forward to growing into that world together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And, and before we move on to a couple of videos, can I also welcome Christina McKelvey, who was the former convener of the Equalities Committee that started that inquiry and has now been promoted, rightfully, I would say, uh, to be a minister responsible for equalities and older people encompassing human rights. Welcome to Ms. McKelvey. You just give her a little welcome. Okay. Now we have a couple of videos to show. The first one is from Michelle Bachelet, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, followed by one from Dunja Milatovic, Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights. So we'll show those videos just now, please. Let's hope technology works. 70 years ago, upon the ashes of countries devastated by war, the Holocaust and economic depression, war leaders devised a plan. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was conceived as a detailed map to guide the world's people out of conflict and suffering and ensure that relations within societies and between states could be sustainable and peaceful. The declaration inspired liberation movements and led to better access to justice, social protection, economic opportunities and political participation. Wherever respect for its commitment has been present, the dignity of millions have been uplifted, suffering prevented, and the foundations led for a more just world. We need to keep pushing forward. People are increasingly fearful of the great changes our world is experiencing, and it is precisely at times of turmoil and uncertainty that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights can guide us. Step by step, it likes the path. We need more respect, greater justice, we need to uphold human equality and dignity. And we can achieve this. All of us, wherever we are, can make a difference by standing up for everyone's human rights. Presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I cannot be with you today, 
but I welcome the opportunity to address you on the occasion of this commemorative event for the 17th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Declaration is founded on a simple yet crucial principle. We are all born free and equal in dignity and rights. For over 70 years, the principles stemming from the vision have transformed the lives of millions and continue to give hope to countless more. Yet today, we are at a crossroads. The very values we stand for are under attack. Populism, nationalism and far-right ideologies are gaining ground across Europe and around the world. We see rapidly evolving restrictions on freedom of speech and assembly, with journalists, human rights defenders and academics killed and imprisoned, and civil society organizations smeared and prosecuted. We see hatred and intolerance. Many people in Europe continue to face marginalization and violence because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Asylum seekers trying to find a safe haven in Europe are turned away, left without rescue or beaten up. Our societies are breeding divisive levels of inequality, fear and polarization, moving us away from equality, freedom and dignity for all. In that context, we must stand firm to achieve the vision of the Declaration. We need governments to be strong advocates for human rights in Europe. In that respect, Scotland can take great pride in being a leading force in Europe protecting and promoting human rights. It has, for example, a government that has incorporated human rights in its national performance framework a national action plan on human rights frequently cited as a good example, including by my office, a parliament that closely scrutinizes human rights issues with an active and impressive equality and human rights committee, a strong national human rights institution in the Scottish Human Rights Commission and other bodies like the Children and Young Persons Commissioner. And not in the least, it has a vibrant civil society, many of them present today, committed to improving the lives of those around them. At the same time, we should remain alert. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, human rights are made real in the small places at home. This means standing up for the single mother living in poverty, for the disabled child who is unable to attend a mainstream school, for the recent graduate who faces discrimination in the labor market because of, this gypsy, uh, of his gypsy traveler's heritage, or the young person who is afraid that she will be put in immigration detention because she lacks documents. There are your neighbors, friends, classmates. They may be you, simply one of us. We must make human rights a reality for every person. This requires passing on to future generation the values of tolerance and human rights so that these are taken forward, not simply to comply with international treaties nor because it enhances a country's reputation internationally, but first and foremost because doing so has direct and meaningful impact on the everyday lives of ordinary people and help build societies where every person can thrive. I wish you a fruitful meeting. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to invite Bianca Jagger. Ms Jagger has committed her life to defending human rights, civil liberties, peace, justice and environmental protection throughout the world. She campaigns to end capital punishment and violence against women and girls and advocates for the rights of indigenous peoples and future generations. Bianca Jagger is founder, president and chief executive of the Bianca Jagger Human Rights Foundation which she established in 2005 to be a force for change and a voice for the most vulnerable. Born in Managua, Nicaragua in 1950, Bianca Jagger left her native country to study political science in Paris with a scholarship from the French government. She is Council of Europe's Goodwill Ambassador, a member of the Executive Director's Leadership Council for Amnesty International USA, IUCN Bonn Challenge Ambassador and Senior Fellow Centre for International Governance Innovation. 
Ms Jagger is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the Right Livelihood Award 2004, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. She has won many other awards for her human rights, humanitarian and environmental work, and has received four doctorates from universities around the world. She also tweets in four languages. I learned that today. That's, that's a biggie. Anyway, Ms Jagger, I invite you to, to speak to us, please. I can't tell you what a pleasure and a privilege it is for me to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Dear First Minister, Member of Parliament, distinguished members of NGOs, ladies, gentlemen, good morning. The 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a reason to feel proud and happy for all of those throughout the world who have been human rights defenders. It is for me a great pleasure to be here in the Parliament of Scotland and to see that they are trying to make rights right to see a parliament that wants to be guarantor of human rights. Human rights are under siege throughout the world. And as you heard, I was born in Nicaragua. I am a Nicaraguan and a British citizen. Certainly, human rights are under threat in the country where I was born, in Nicaragua, where there is more than 600 um, prisoners, political prisoners, who are mostly innocent. And today in Nicaragua, there are six of my friends, students, who are being tried under false accusation for terrorism. Nothing could be further from the truth. I want to say that human rights are not only under siege in the developed world and far away. As a British citizen, I feel that Brexit can be a threat to our human rights. And for that reason, I thank the recommendations that are being put forward today for considering and looking into what the effect that Brexit could have in all human rights and in your human rights here in Scotland. I was born in Nicaragua and my mother was my inspiration. She taught me the importance of human rights, the importance of democracy, the importance of the environment and of the rainforest. And it was through her that I learned what I know today, but it is Eleanor Roosevelt who has been my role model. And her example, and let's not forget that if we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's because of this great woman who fought for it at a time when women were relegated to play second roles. That doesn't mean that women are allowed to play equal roles in today's society. I can tell you that as a human rights defender, that I encounter that all the time. But of course, we are privileged. There are other women that have it more difficult than we do. And that is one of the reasons why, as a human rights defender, I have fought for the rights of women, for the rights for us to achieve gender equality, for achieve equal pay. But as well, I, 
I campaigned for the most vulnerable. I campaigned for indigenous people, for women, for children, for prisoners on death row. So please, let's not take human rights for granted. Our human rights are too under siege. And today, we are at a crossroad where we must make sure that those rights will not suffer if Brexit is imposed on those of us who feel that we want to remain part of Europe. I don't know if I'm supposed to be telling you that, but I, <laughs> as a Nicaraguan and as a British citizen, I value being part of Europe. And I value everything that Europe brought to us. And let's not forget it. Let's continue to struggle. And for all the young people who are here, I want to say, please continue to make human rights an important part of your life. It is critical for your future that we adults and human rights defenders continue to defend your rights. Let's stand for human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, inspirational uh, stuff as usual. Can I call on, uh, I'd like to welcome Hannah, uh, who is a member of the Children's Parliament, and Ryan McShane, member of the Scottish Youth Parliament, followed by the First Minister of Scotland, the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP. Hannah is 12, a member of the Children's Parliament, and a human rights defender. She recently represented Scotland at the United Nations and co-moderated a side event at the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child during its day of general discussion. Ryan is 16 and represent Who Cares, Scotland and the Scottish Youth Parliament. He is also convener of the Sport and Leisure Committee. Hannah and Ryan, please, if you come to the microphone. <laughs> It's not a duet. Yes, right. Yeah. Who's going first? You going first? Yeah. Right, Ryan. Um, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, I'd like to start today by thanking um, my fellow pupils of St Ambrose High School from Cope Bridge, who continue to support me in the work I do. Um, that's near enough every day. Um, and I'm sure everybody in the Chamber and Parliament today will welcome them. Um, to this very special day for us to celebrate it, so they're in the gallery. <laughs> so, as the Deputy Presiding Officer said, um, I am 16, I'm care experienced and I'm part of a movement. And I'm a human rights defender and I'm proud of that. I'm here today in my role as a member of and convener of the Scottish Youth Parliament, or at the Scottish Youth Parliament, representing Who Cares Scotland. Human rights belong to everyone, but also children and young people have additional rights under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UNCRC, if it is 18 or under. Rights bring about a culture where human beings are treated with dignity and respect, but they need to be protected in a binding, not guiding way by duty bearers for this to be a reality. Human rights on me are more often violated and respected in society. This is why I'm a human rights defender, because my constituents and friends have their basic human rights denied every day, and this cannot continue to happen if Scotland is tru truly going to be the best place to grow up in. Defending human rights means taking actions, small or big, to stand up and promote or defend human rights, such as challenging unfair treatment or discrimination and campaigning in your local community. I used to think of this as being a privilege, but actually I have the right to defend my rights and to hold our decision makers to account and to be safe while doing so. 
I learnt this as part of the Scottish delegation, supported by the Children and Young People's Commissioner, that went to the, the United Nations in September. This was truly life-changing for me and a humbling experience. It made me sad that I'd shared the experience of trauma and poverty with those who are living in Syria in the middle of a war zone. Speaking at the UN allowed me to talk about trauma through my own experience, because from the day I went into foster care and having been in and out of the care system since I was born, I moved at least 15 times, and these are places that every time I was supposed, I was supposed to call home. That truly is sad. At the UN, I wanted to highlight my belief that care experienced young people should have the chance at having a second family, like I've had through my foster carers whom I'm proud to actually call, after seven and a half years, my parents, as well as a chance to experience love. The care system should be the end of the hard part, when the trauma, abuse and neglect are over. My new mum and dad showered me with love, but I will no longer stand to be the exception to the rule. The preamble to the UNCRC states that with all rights inside properly respected, protected and fulfilled, we should all grow up in an atmosphere of love, happiness and understanding. People in power have a duty to make sure that this is a reality for children and young people. From Coatbridge to Geneva, I feel listened to. Here today, I feel listened to. The opportunity to protect love by safeguarding children and young people's rights when making policies and ensuring recourse if our rights are denied is right here, right now. All of us at the Scottish Youth Parliament and at Who Cares Scotland. We're thrilled to hear the commitment in the programme for government for the principles of the UNCRC to be incorporated in the Scots domestic law. We now want to see that happen without any delay. The opportunity ahead of you, First Minister, is to become the ultimate human rights defender by incorporating the UNCRC fully into Scots law within this parliamentary term. That would mean the world to me from the heart. And now I will hand you over to Hannah, who will tell you more about the experience at the UN and her amazing work. Thank you, Ryan. Some adults think that children who are part of Children's Parliament are already full of confidence when they begin. However, however this couldn't be further from the truth. My experience is quite typical of many other children at Children's Parliament. When I was asked to join the Streets Ahead project, I still can't even remember why I said yes. I was lacking so much confidence and I wasn't joining anything. I'd experienced being bullied and found it hard to, to make new friendships. Because Cameron in my class had said yes, I thought I'd give it a try. From all the support I got from the other MCPs and all the other adults involved, I've achieved many more things than I thought I could. The Cabinet meeting, the United Nations, and being part of the Global Children's Advisory Team, which planned for this year's Day of General Discussion in Geneva. Cameron and I were the only two children from the UK to be part of this team. It was an amazing journey that thankfully we're still on. One of the highlights for me has been the workshop programme. I co-ran two workshops, one in my old primary school, Windigal, and the other in Bimbecula Primary. We help children understand and the impact that rights can make upon our lives, and that they're important because they help us keep safe, healthy, and happy and to grow as human beings. We then asked children to tell us what rights they felt were most important to them now. I enjoyed seeing how much children enjoyed learning from other children, and I felt both responsible and proud. One little girl was so excited that I was her teacher that every time she saw me over the summer, she used to do a handstand for me. This experience made me realize I really want to become a teacher when I'm older. After the workshops, 12 of us created five giant shields based on the workshop's information and drawings. We took the shields to the UN along with our own individual shields. We definitely made a rave on Twitter. We then we will be giving tours of our shields at lunchtime and hope, to, and hope to see you all there. My individual shield was all about girls having equal rights to boys, but looking back now, I wish I'd done it more about equal rights. Because let's face it, both boys and girls are discriminated against because of stereotyping. I don't want to give anything away, but this could possibly be a new children's parliament project I've already started working on. My journey so far has been amazing, and I'd like to see more children have the same opportunities as we've had. We just need adults to believe in us and give us opportunities to help make Scotland a great, great, great country to grow up in. Back to you, Ryan.
We are now delighted to invite the First Minister of Scotland, the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, to speak. The First Minister, the First Minister will present to us the views of the Scottish Government. Absolutely wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, thank you to all of the speakers who have already uh, made their contributions this morning, but I hope you will understand that I want to make a special mention of Ryan and Hannah. Uh, as you just heard, Ryan and Hannah do so much fantastic work here at home. They have both represented Scotland on the world stage. Uh, to both of you, let me say from the heart, you are a credit to your generation and you're an absolute credit to this country. Thank you for all that you do. It's such a huge pleasure and privilege for me to be here today and it's fantastic to be joined by so many people here in the Chamber of Scotland's National Parliament for what is a very significant gathering. Any Human Rights Day is extremely important but obviously this year's Human Rights Day is especially notable. As we've heard already this morning, this year we are marking several important anniversaries. Uh, the 20th anniversary of the Human Rights Act and of course the Scotland Act that established this parliament and embedded human rights at its heart and the 10th anniversary of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. But important though those anniversaries are, uh, most Historic of all is the anniversary of the signing of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Exactly seven years ago today, that declaration was signed in Paris. And it expresses better, I think, than any other document before or since that post-war yearning for a better world. Uh, the UN Declaration was born out of the horrors of the first half of last century and it was based on a universal belief that the world's future should be better than its past and that is a belief I think we should hold on to, celebrate and cherish just as much today as the founders of the UN Declaration did 70 years ago. Today's Human Rights Day also of course has a crucial modern significance. As uh, Bianca Jagger and Judith Robertson uh, have already uh, reflected upon, around the world today, there are many, too many alarming signs that in some countries, uh, some people are forgetting, perhaps deliberately, the lessons of the last century. And because of that, we risk going backwards rather than forwards in our approach to human rights and we must all of us collectively on this Human Rights Day resolve that we are not prepared to be bystanders and allow that to happen. Of course here in the UK Brexit also poses a risk to human rights protections. So the theme of today this year's Human Rights Day stand up for human rights is both an important one and an extremely timely one. As First Minister of Scotland, I am determined that the Scottish Government will be recognised internationally as a government that does stand up for human rights. Uh, and because of that, of course, today's Human Rights Day, in addition to its international and its UK-wide relevance, has a very specific importance for Scotland as well. Uh, the Scottish Government right now is considering three closely interrelated issues. Uh, two weeks ago, we received the very valuable report of the Equality and Human Rights Committee that contains important recommendations for government, for this parliament, and for the Scottish Human Rights Commission. We have also confirmed that next year, 2019, we will take the next step towards incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scots law, uh, something I feel very passionate about and let me assure you, Ryan, I'm very committed to. And of course, earlier today, 
I received the final report of my own advisory group on human rights leadership. Now, I don't have time to comment in detail on all of these matters, although later on in my remarks I will say a bit more about the advisory group's report. But I want to stress that all three of these areas of work will be taken forward in parallel. They will follow different timetables, but all of them will lead to action as quickly as is reasonably possible. And all of them, in different ways, will contribute to one of our key ambitions for Scotland. We want Scotland to be a country where human rights are not just respected in theory, but where they make an important and a positive difference to people's everyday lives. And we also want Scotland, as a result of that, to be recognised as an international leader in human rights. Of course, in doing that, we are already starting from a strong position. In 2006, this parliament, of course, legislated to create the Scottish Human Rights Commission. 2013 saw the launch of the Scottish Government's first national action plan for human rights. Our national performance framework now specifically includes the protection of human rights as one of our 11 key national outcomes. Uh, because of all of that, human rights approaches are already influencing our implementation of policy. Whether that's the design of care standards for older people's homes or the implementation of our new social security system. In fact, uh, this year's Social Security Act, like several other recent pieces of legislation, refers explicitly to the UN treaties. Our international development strategy also has human rights at its core. Our projects help to promote gender equality, create strong civil institutions and provide access to education, energy and clean water. And of course we have instituted a Human Rights Defender Fellowship. That enables human rights defenders from elsewhere in the world, uh, people who are so often operating in highly stressful and dangerous environments, to spend three months here with us in Scotland. That time allows them to rest and recharge and also to develop new skills and new contacts. It's a further way in which we are trying to promote human rights overseas, as well as enhancing human rights here at home. In all of this, there's perhaps one key point that I would draw out. Human rights obligations are not and should never be seen as optional for governments. That much, I hope, is self-evident. But neither should human rights ever be seen as a burden on government. Human rights are a help to government. They help us to develop better policies. And perhaps even more importantly, they help us to deliver and implement those policies more effectively. After all, or when you start off in the policy making process by thinking about the dignity and the rights of every individual, that has an impact. Your policy making is then immediately grounded in the experiences of people rather than in the expedience of government. And that almost inevitably will lead to better outcomes. In fact, although it's still early days, I believe that the contrast between our development of a new social security system for Scotland and, for example, the rollout of universal credit at a UK level uh, will in time be seen as a case study of that approach of putting human rights at the heart of policy from the very outset. So for all of these reasons, I've been determined to ensure that the Scottish Government acts to further enhance human rights, uh, which is why earlier this year I established an advisory group on human rights leadership chaired by Professor Alan Miller. And I asked for the advice of that advisory group on three very closely related issues. Firstly, I want to make sure that as far as possible, we do not allow Brexit, if it happens, to cause any harm to human rights in Scotland. Secondly, I want Scotland to remain in step with any future advances in EU, EU human rights. And finally, I asked the group for recommendations to ensure that Scotland is and can be seen to be an international leader in respecting and enhancing human rights. As we've heard, the advisory group published its final report earlier this morning, and I want to take the opportunity to sincerely thank Professor Miller and all of the group members for the outstanding uh, job that they have done in producing an excellent report. 
The report is uh, clearly, as I expected, a detailed, challenging and ambitious document. It will be of huge value as we look to show leadership for the future. And importantly, that will be the case regardless of Scotland's future constitutional status. Uh, that report will be debated here in our Parliament and will be considered uh, by this committee. The Scottish Government, of course, will provide a formal response in due course. I won't preempt all of that today, but I do want to confirm immediately that I endorse the report's overall vision of a new human rights framework for Scotland with a new Act of Parliament at its very heart. And I can confirm that I uh, will establish a national task force, as the report recommends that I do, to carry that work forward in 2019 and beyond. Uh, and the task force will play a crucial role in ensuring that there is wide-ranging public participation uh, as the recommendations of the report are considered and implemented. Because as Judith said earlier on, uh, and it is a key point, uh, human rights don't belong to governments or to policy makers. Human rights belong to people. And it must be the case that we give ownership of this process to people. Uh, let me finally uh, comment on one further uh, point, which I know will be discussed in the weeks and months ahead, but it is, in my view, a fundamental one. A key part of the report's recommendations involves embedding social and economic rights into a statutory framework. And it is interesting, I think, to look back on this. 70 years ago, when the UN declaration was under discussion, social and economic rights back then were a source of contention. And that's one reason why, while the rights of free speech and religion set out in clauses 1 to 22 subsequently formed the basis of documents such as the European Convention on Human Rights. The social and economic rights set out in later uh, sections were not so fully incorporated. But all of us know that economic and social disadvantage limits people's ability to fulfil their potential. And we also know, because we are seeing evidence of it around the world, that inequality can foster a sense of resentment and exclusion from society, which then itself can lead to further human rights abuses. In that context, in my view, any government that claims to be progressive has a duty to think deeply and to act ambitiously on how we give the right to a decent standard of living the same status as rights to free speech, association or religion. Today's report provides a thoughtful and authoritative view on how we can achieve that in Scotland. And as a result of that, I believe it will improve people's lives here in Scotland and help Scotland to demonstrate true international leadership. And both of those aspirations are important. Uh, I began my remarks today by reflecting on the signing of the UN Declaration. The men and women who drafted that declaration knew because they had witnessed it for themselves that human progress is not inevitable. Human rights can never be taken for granted. They always need to be protected, cherished and argued for. And as we look around the world right now, there is, we know, a genuine danger of these lessons being disregarded. So it is more important than ever that countries like Scotland do stand up for human rights. By doing so, we can send an important signal to the rest of the world. And we can also ensure that human rights make a real and meaningful difference to people's every day lives. In the words of the Charter, we can promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. Uh, so my belief is that this conference and today's report will play a part in, in securing that social progress and achieving these better standards of life. And my hope is that as a result, Scotland will be a beacon for others. So for all of these reasons, I see today's event as perhaps one of the most significant that has taken place in this parliamentary chamber. I look forward very much to working with all of you in the months and years to come as we promote human rights here in Scotland and signal our support for them in every part of our world. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, First Minister. And I'd now like to welcome pupils from Oban High School and Heinlein Secondary School in Glasgow, who will be reading poems that they've prepared for today. The schools are both participants in Amnesty International's Human Rights Education Programme and have been invited by Amnesty to share their work on International Human Rights Day. First of all, can I invite Oban High School pupils to come, well, you're there already, to come <laughs> forward, please. The pupils have been exploring their rights and responsibilities and are working on ways to give back to their community, as well as raising awareness of human rights internationally by hosting an Amnesty International Right for Rights event at the Hope Kitchen in Oban. They have written their poem in Gaelic and in English and will be reciting both versions. Open High School, please. Round of applause. Second of September, 1945. The guns felt silent. But that could not be the end. The Second World War demanded change. Change of minds and change of hearts. That change came 70 years ago today. Human rights are universal. Everyone deserves a chance. A chance to be loved and to live without unlawful prosecution, without segregation and division. Our rights cannot be bargained with. We are people, not political toys. Our rights are inalienable. Our rights must be upheld. Our lives must be lived without fear and hatred. We deserve to be free, free to be respected and cared for, regardless of sex, religion or race. So today, 70 years on, in a time where immigrants' rights are uncertain, I ask you to consider, who are you? Are you compassionate and loving, or are you vengeful and full of hate? Thank you. Canon Prishol, Corican Prishol. Chayat na Gaelic a cúr ar vók, an an dávíl is a chúig. She shin a hiat turis, a hura canon, corican simbi, on a sulin and Not till 2005 did the law change. Before, our parents were beaten for their words, their thoughts, the right to speak freely, to learn. It was to command equal respect with English, not equal validity, not parity of esteem. I suppose it was a start. And has allowed me to start by expressing this right, as others throughout the world have fought and will fight to claim their rights. We have traveled far, but our journey's just begun. Eternal vigilance must be our guide, for injustice is hidden far and wide. We are the future, the hope and the light. We must keep up our guard, for the battle's not won and the times are still hard. Human rights. So precious. Corican Dunya, Ho Prishal. Thank you. I was always told that I could be myself, but I can't seem to see identity on the bookshelf. It's not a textbook I can pick up or learn. This seems to be knowledge that I have to earn. But ask yourself this. Is humanity stable? Are we all achieving what we are able? I know this is strange listening to me, a high school student standing tall, pretending she's a know-it-all, but just in case I strike a nerve, I remind you all I'm here to serve, here to deliver words that I've written, here to enjoy the freedom I've been given. But may I remind you it's not universal. It's not worldwide, not the be-all and end-all for people not like us people without their rights, people who die in their desperate fights to live as themselves, to breathe air that is theirs, to wonder what life would be without any cares, to hold on to their voices and use them alone without being told, be quiet, go home. Thank you. I'd uh, now like to invite Heinlein Secondary School pupils to come forward. Whilst writing their poem, the pupils have been giving some thought to the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and how important children's rights are under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. The school motto reflects their feelings about human rights around the world. Quotes, I hope for better things, close quotes. Heinlein Secondary School, please. 
Everyone, see me, hear me. Let, Let us all say, everyone is unique in their own way. No one should suffer discrimination or exploitation. Everyone has the right to health, happiness and inclusive education. No one should have their rights abused or restricted. They should be upheld, lauded, celebrated. These rights are the foundation of all laws. Speak up, shout out, share the news. Everyone is entitled to respectful views. These rights should guide us, lead us from fear, hardship, oppression, never to bear down on us, like the weight of the world on our shoulder. Everyone, see us, hear us, let us all say, respect me. Everyone is unique in their own way. No one should experience bullying, suffer terror or deprivation. We all have the right to freedom in every nation across the world. Individuality is strength, a voice that speaks out for every one of us. Respect this and follow your dreams to wherever they may lead you. Written in hope, not in fear. Born out of sufferings, we won't shed more tears. Set your sights on human rights. Take time to be kind to know your rights in the declaration signed. In 1948, a promise was made to you, to me, to never fade. With human rights, we should never have to fight for fairness, kindness, and freedom to take flight. These are your rights. Never forget or lose faith in the declaration that binds us in love. Everyone, stand up now, speak up now. Make all our voices heard. Where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Honesty and integrity must guide your conscience. In every village, every country, and every continent. Everyone, stand up, speak up, make all our voices heard. All Sebels is born free and equal in dignity and rights. Right, thank you. To, thank you to both schools. We're now going to take a short comfort break. Please be back here at 11:45. There are events personnel at the back. If you get lost, or leave a trail of breadcrumbs, whichever you find more suitable. 11:45, please.
that, we're going to move on to a panel discussion with a panel of leading human rights advocates and experts. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the panel, starting with Amal Azud. Uh, 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 oh, yeah, I knew I'd get it wrong. Azudin. That's it. Sorry, my apologies. At the age of 15, Amal rose to prominence as a human rights campaigner as part of the Glasgow Girls, who campaigned against, you'll remember this, against Don Ray's detention and deportation of asylum seekers in Glasgow. Amal has an MSc in human rights and international politics from Glasgow University. She is an ambassador for the Scottish Refugee Council. She works as the Equality and Human Rights Officer for the Mental Health Welfare Foundation in Scotland. There we are. So welcome her, please. Just to see. I'm just testing you're still awake with us. Dr. Donald McCaskill, having worked in health and social care sectors, Donald has specialised in learning disability and older people's work, in particular issues related to palliative care and individual rights. For 13 years, he ran the Quality and Human Rights Consultancy, focusing on adult protection, risk, and personalisation. He is now the CEO of Scottish Care, the representative body for the Independent Social Care Services in Scotland. In August 2018, he wrote Tech Rights, Human Rights, Technology and Social Care, calling for human rights and ethical-based approach to new technologies. Dr. Donald McCaskill. Davy Donaldson, he's a wee bit nervous, so be gentle with him, he's told me that. He was even asking for questions in advance. <laughs> yeah, see, I can sabotage you, Davy. <laughs> Davy is a Scottish traveller activist and a campaigner for equality and inclusion. He is a member of the Young Gypsy Travel Assembly and Article 12 in Scotland. Davy has spoken regularly around the country about the discrimination faced by the traveller community. He studies social anthropology with international relations at Aberdeen University and works with young travellers to conserve their history and to promote their culture. David Davidson. <laughs> Donald. I'm going to see a C. Mary Fee MSP in the audience, and Mary Fee has done a lot of campaigning about justice for travellers in Scotland. So just to say that, Mary, your name's on the record. You've done a lot. Give her a wee round of applause. You've done a lot of work. There. Uh, Dr. Sally Witcher, OBE. Sally has a long history of work relating to equalities, diversity, poverty, social inclusion, and human rights. The latter includes recent activities around the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and as a member of the Scottish National Action Plan Leadership Group. She was awarded an OBE in 2006 for services to disabled people and is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Inclusion Scotland. Dr. Sally Witcher. Now, this is, a, this is a great opportunity for you to ask questions. I would encourage everyone to participate as fully as possible. Don't let me down. And can I ask that you keep your questions as brief as possible? I'm notorious in the Parliament for being tough on folk that ramble, ramble on. You know me well. Uh, I will take a couple of questions at a time, if appropriate, and invite the panel to respond. You may want to direct your question to one particular panel member. If you do, just say so. Uh, but otherwise, I'll just put it across all the panellists. Uh, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand. And once I've invited, there's somebody right away. You were quick. You're right in there. I like it. Um, uh, once invited to speak, you please wait for the red light on the microphone to come on. It'd be helpful if you stood up while speaking, uh, if that's uh, okay with you. And before making any points, could you please introduce yourself by name and, if relevant, your organisation. And there are staff on hand with microphones. There's a gentleman right there, there at the end of the row. His hands up. Put your hand right up. So there we are. There we are. It's There's a, there's a gentleman right there with a microphone. Yes, there, yes, sir. Uh -huh. Does your red light come on? Yes. There you go. Stand up, please, and tell us who you are. My name is Jun Fei Hu. I'm a Chinese. I come to UK for 15 years. I'm an immigration, but I have problem with home office. Home office plan to deport me. I think this is my human rights to stay in this country. I love this country. Thank you very much. Now, who would like to answer that? I can start. Um, Amal. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry to hear about what you're going through. Um, unfortunately, the asylum system, the way it's designed, it's, it's just not fit for purpose. And it causes a lot of mental health problems as well for people. I work with asylum seekers and refugees um, on a daily basis who are going through similar situations as you. And sadly, because uh, in Scotland we don't have control of immigration, it's really hard to get a lot done. Um, so we're always campaigning for a, a better, fair, uh, and just humane system. Um, I can sh say to you that I, I, I'm an ambassador for the Scottish Refugee Council, and they do amazing work. So I'm not sure if you've had any contact with them, if you've done any uh, work with them before. I am not a refugee. I'll let you come. I'll let you come back in. Yes, just just speak up. Yes. I am not a refugee. I'm an immigration. Right. I'm, I'm a PhD in the University of Leeds. Right, okay. I'm an electronics engineer. The only problem is that I go back to China over six months. They say it's not continuous 10 years leave. Okay. I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a legal I issue. I think so, yeah. Probably, do, do, I don't know if you have a lawyer. Yes, um, I have a lawyer. But it's, uh, I applied for settlement four, uh, five, six years ago, five, five years ago now. It's still on settlement. And uh, I, can't, I can't work. I can only do volunteer. Uh, I, I volunteer to the community for four years. I published a book, Hope, Love, and Peace. I still believe it. Yep. Dr. McCats, you, you uh, wanted just, to make a comment here. Just to say, uh, uh, it's not accidental that today we're reflecting on the 70 years since the declaration was signed in a context where there were hundreds of thousands of individuals wandering Europe with no sense of home, nowhere to call themselves belonging to, and the mark of any country, and this is the mark which all of us in Scotland would want to aspire to, is how we welcome those who wish to come and make our society better than it is. And for, for my sector, the social care sector, one of our major concerns at the moment is that we need to continue to be able to welcome the thousands of people from across the world who want to come to Scotland to make this place their home. So I, I have absolute sympathy for your, your, your situation. And with others, we would like to see in the years that are ahead of us, a human rights based system of migration which enables people to be treated as people and not as statistics. Um, can, I, can I say, are there microphones up in the gallery at all? Is it possible to get a mobile mic up there? I've got, somebody wants to ask a question right behind you. Lady moving along there, but I... No, it, it's at the far, it's a chap away up the back, you see? Well, look, right to the rescue, to the rescue. Get the climbing gear. That's it. Over, oh, there's one way over, chap away over here. And while we're doing that, is there anybody down here who wants to ask a question? Right, we've got a couple of hands up. I'll take the lady first, then I'll take the gentleman. Right, so if you, is your red light come on? Right. Hi, my name's Pauline Gregor and I'm here from supporting Borders Additional Needs Group based on the Scottish Borders. I just wanted to ask the panel a question about children with additional support needs and learning, about where they stand with the use of restraint and seclusion in education at the moment, because it's a breach of their human rights under Article 14 of the UNCR. I'm not, I'm not allowed to answer that, though I represent the borders, but I do have answers, but I better not do it. Uh, right, who's going to take this about children with additional needs and their human rights? I, sh I should declare it, uh, an interest in that I'm the governor of, uh, one of the governors of PAMIS, which is the Profound and Multiple Learning Disability Charity. I think the way in which we treat our children, particularly those who have chosen or who cannot use voice and words to communicate, is a fundamental mark of who we are as a society. We, all of us, would challenge in our behaviour if we were not heard, if our voice was not respected, if our wishes were not adhered to. So we have to find a better way, not just for children, but for adults who are locked in into their own worlds of frustration and who cannot make their voice heard. And restraint in whatever form is wholly and utterly unacceptable. And Dr Witcher. 
I mean, the whole issue around how we re respond to people with additional support needs, children in particular, I think is absolutely fundamental to this whole dis debate today because it's about understanding people's equal humanity. It's about understanding that you invest in people when they have additional needs and that if you invest in them, that you can then reap the benefits, that they can reap the benefits, they can contribute. When it comes to education, mainstreaming and inclusive education is key, but it has to be properly resourced, and so often it is not. And that's again where so much so often falls down. So it requires a fundamental shift in attitude. It requires understanding and listening, uh, as Donald has already said, to the people on the sharp end who have the lived experience because they know best what they need. They know best what barriers they encounter, and they know best what is going to remove those barriers. And whilst we have professionals assessing people, disabled people, children, children who are disabled people themselves, and whilst those people themselves are not being heard, human rights are not going to be realized. And Scotland will be the poorer for it. It's not just individuals, it's our economy, it's our society, it's our community. Thank you. I'll take the gentleman there and then I'll take the gentleman up in the gallery after. So I'll take you first, please. Ken McLennan, retired, but I think I'm a human rights activist. Um, I'm delighted to hear about the government's commitment to human rights today. It was really great to hear what was coming from the floor. Uh, but sadly, there is clear evidence to show that the compliance with equalities and human rights uh, legislation is not always happening here in Scotland. Public bodies and regulatory bodies are not always protecting the most vulnerable and most marginalised of our community, communities. For example, in relation to mental health services and in relation to the treatment of the Scottish Gypsy Traveller community. Um, how do we get our public bodies to comply with the law at all times? I think that's one for you, yes? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I've heard a lot about your fantastic work as well, so we'll have to catch a word afterwards. Um, again, I share your frustration. Um, we hear a lot about Scotland being this inclusive, almost egalitarian um, beacon, but actually through my own lived experience as a Scottish traveller and through the lived experience of many others I know, um, it isn't actually the case, and indeed there is human rights breaches on a, on a daily basis towards the community and ongoing inequalities and barriers. Um, in trying to answer your question, which I can't, I can't answer your question, and indeed if I had the answer, then um, I wouldn't be able to, to say that we're still experiencing inequalities. Um, but I hope that going forward we have seen a renewed commitment from both the Scottish Government um, and countless NGOs as well that they're going to start um, embedding the lived experience of gypsy travellers and other marginalised groups um, in order to put forward um, better policy which better reflects that lived experience in order to mitigate the inequalities. So I'm hesitantly hopeful um, that going forward into 2019 and, and future years that we won't um, see as much inequality and, and barriers towards the gypsy traveller community and that we will help to demarginalise it through embodying the lived experience. Um, I realise that doesn't answer your question, but unfortunately I don't have an answer to it. You'll never meet a politician who's telling the truth, huh? I tell you. <laughs> so, can I take the gentleman up the gallery now, please? Thank you. Hi, my name is Hamid. I'm from Iran, uh, a former political prisoner. I spent days in solitary confinement. Just wanted to ask about a double standard uh, in European approach about human rights in Middle East. Uh, the ISIS has executed more than 5,000 people uh, in the last 50 months. While the Iranian re regime uh, has executed more than 3,000 in the same time. Just wanted to ask uh, why the European government 
don't have the same relation uh, with the ISIS? Why don't they uh, save the ISIS as they, they are doing for the theocracy in Iran? No. Who's going to tackle that? You've reduced them all to silence. I don't know what if you, any comments to make. What would you like to see done? A few days ago, uh, the Amnesty International reported about uh, 1988, 1988 massacre, which uh, was uh, execution of three, uh, execution of thirty thousand of political prisoners in a few months. While I have been asked from uh, ask your 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 colleagues to to condemn that, uh, to recognize that as a uh, crime against humanity. But uh, it seems that trade, trade relation and GCPOA, the nuclear deal, is more important than the human rights. Yes. I, I, I think you're going to have yeah. a... Yeah. I think at the risk of speaking on behalf of all the panellists, I don't think any of us would have difficulty in condemning that barbarity. Uh, 70 years ago... Uh, we, we, the world was coming out of the horrors of the Holocaust where millions, because they did not fit, because they were Jewish, because they were gypsy travelers, communists, Christian, homosexual, were annihilated. We have seen the same sense of horror in so many places at the hands of ISIS and, and others. And human rights then, 70 years ago, was about trying to make a world where that degree of barbarity was replaced by people being able to relate to people who they didn't necessarily always agree with. We have a constant reminder, I think, that we have a huge distance to go and we must all of us continually condemn barbarity regardless of whether or not it brings economic discomfort to our nation as a trader or to ourselves as individuals. So I think we would all be with you in that condemnation. I, I think you make a very fair point that many of us are often very uncomfortable about trade relations vis-a-vis -vis human rights without you know, going into specifics. I'm not, I'm not supposed to say anything, but I think we're all extremely uncomfortable. We would like to see different um, mores, different morality, perhaps generally from uh, nations uh, across the world. Many are at fault. Uh, I've got, I'm going to take this gentleman here and then I'm going to go online, but I'm, I'm coming back down, yes. But I'll take you next and then I'll take you after we've been online and then the gentleman next to you, right? So, lady in purple, gentleman next, after, after I've taken this one, then to the web. Have we got many questions? Well, oh, we've got a lot of questions. <laughs> right, so first of all, this gentleman. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Danny Boyle. I work for, for Bemis Scotland. Bemis are a, a race equality charity. Um, just to say thank you very much to, to everybody who help, who's helped bring the conference together. It's quite, it's, I'm sure there's many people quite emotional this morning listening to the, the different interventions. It's superb to hear the Scottish Government's commitment. So that's the, that's the basis of my question uh, to the panel members forecasting into the future. Uh, when I read the, the, the Human Rights Leadership Report this morning, they talked about moving, particularly with, with reference to economic, social and cultural rights, moving from the progressive realisation the, from the maxim, maximum of available resources to a duty to comply, to ensure that our rights uh, become substantial and that they are physically experienced by every one of us. So just to ask each of the panel members from the perspective of a mental health charity, Gypsy Traveller, health and social care, and people with disabilities, what has to happen within that context of a duty to comply within your areas of expertise eh, for us actually to see these rights realised with a particular reference to economic, social and cultural rights? Thank you. 
Now, that, that's the way to ask a question. In fact, every one of you has got one there, so I'll start at the end, first of all, with you. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, comment and the, and the question. Uh, for me, working with asylum seekers and refugees, um, sadly, people face a lot of issues and a lot of barriers. Uh, I, I work with somebody who's been seeking asylum for 24 years. Now, asylum seekers are not allowed to work and are not allowed to um, go to university until they receive refugee status, so imagine seeking asylum for that length of time, not being able to live your life. Um, and, and that's just one story, and I can tell you so many. Um, but as someone who came to the UK uh, as a refugee, I've, I've learned so much, and I understand what people are going through in terms of you know, seeking asylum and so on. And I think what needs to change, as I said earlier, is a more fair and humane system where people are treated with dignity and respect, and also for their rights to be realized, because one thing that we hear quite a lot by refugees and asylum seekers is that they don't know what their rights are. Um, so I think more education needs to be in place and I think obviously the, the kind of struggle for a better and uh, humane system is, is still ongoing. Donald. In, in my own world of health and social care, we've seen enormous strides in the last 10 years because of this parliament's legislation around things like self-directed support around mental health care and treatment. So we've got the building blocks of a human rights based system. But I know every week I speak to somebody who is being told that they cannot exercise their rights to, for instance, self-directed support because they're living in the wrong part of the country. They're over a certain age. So the lived experience of people in health and social care is that we are continually some distance short of where we need to be in order to fully realize rights. And I suppose ultimately setting up, and, and the report this morning is a huge step forward, but ultimately we will not as a nation progress to where we need to be until every woman and man is able to say that human rights are my concern, that it's not just left to the local authorities or health boards or politicians or policy officers, but everybody's concern is the ability to exercise rights, not for themselves, but for the person who cannot speak. So I think we have done a huge amount, but the journey ahead is a challenging one because at some point we're going to have to decide making decisions which are unpopular because they're going to have to be about resourcing rights, not just talking about rights. Davey. Um, thank you very much, Diane, for the question. Um, again, cultural rights is something which myself and others um, advocate for on, on a daily basis, and indeed have done for many years. Um, cultural rights to me as a, as a Scottish traveller um, are, are core to some of the things which I'm fighting for, actually. Um, and one of them, of course, is our ancient tradition of, of nomadism. Um, and the fact that not just in Scotland, but across the UK, that's becoming more and more difficult. Um, in England, um, we're now seeing mass injunctions which ban travellers from um, camping within certain counties, um, and they are spreading, um, which of course is in breach of, of human rights and freedom to express your culture. Um, so to me, it's something really important, and it's something which I've tried to dissect many times um, in order to try and work out why it's happening and how it could be tackled. Um, to me, of course, nomadism is an ancient part of, of my culture, but it's also an ancient part of Scottish culture. You know, travellers have been nomadic in this country for at least 900 years. Um, and so because of that, it isn't just part of my identity as a traveller, but it's also a part of everybody's identity as being, you know, being someone from Scotland or living in Scotland. It's part of what we should see as Scottishness. Um, but it currently isn't. And it's not just my culture, but there's many cultures and different ways of being which currently aren't embodied in what we see as Scottishness. Um, it tends to be tied up within bagpipes and haggis, and I think that's a real shame. So I think what I would advocate for is for the education system to start to embed more different, um, different ways of being and different ways that people live within Scotland and have lived within Scotland so that young people can grow up within a Scotland which has a, a much wider sense of Scottishness than what we currently have. And I think that would put us on a, on a right path to, to change. Sally. Well, um, what has to happen? Uh, a lot. Um, first off, I think we need to see a fundamental change of attitude towards disabled people. 
And that includes the fact of recognising that we are not just disabled people. We, are also, we also have a gender, we have a sexual orientation, we have an age. We have many characteristics. Disabled women are more likely to experience domestic violence than non-disabled women. Let's start thinking broadly about, that, about who disabled people really are and stop sticking us all in a box. I think it's about non-disabled people not speaking for us because part, this is about disempowerment. There are many organisations out there, long-established charities, that are not led by disabled people, but they do not hesitate to talk publicly about what our lived experience is. The UN Committee very recently published a, a, a statement confirming and clarifying that when they talked about engaging the representative organisations of disabled people, they meant those led by disabled people. It would be unthinkable in other equality areas for men to be talking about what it's like to be the lived experience of women, or a white person to talk about what it's like to be black. Bizarrely, it seems when it comes to disability, that doesn't apply. So it's also about understanding what treating disabled people with dignity and respect actually means. What it doesn't mean is, is positioning us as, as inspiring, as awfully tragic but awfully brave. Because that distances us, it turns us into objects of pity. That's, there's nothing dignified or respectful about that whatsoever. Our role is not to make other people feel better about their lives. That's not why we're here. We're not here as a, as a, as a tool to make non-disabled people feel better about themselves. Sometimes that does feel how we are positioned, and it's just not acceptable. Bearing in mind, of course, that so much discrimination against disabled people is not deliberate. People don't think they're being uh, unconstructive or... Um, challenging or in any way negative when, they, when they, they approach us in those sorts of ways. They don't deliberately set out, I sometimes wonder though, to build buildings that wheelchair users can't get into. So it's about the value of the lived experience and really listening to us. And it's about uh, equality across Scotland because I think one of the issues for, for disabled people trying to access services is that there are huge issues in the remote rural, part, rural parts of Scotland. We need to think about it in geographical terms too. So it's about really understanding uh, our equal humanity. It's about rethinking what we mean by normal because it's normal to be different. And finally, it is about what happens in the small places. And I think it's about when people such as myself, visibly disabled people can confidently leave the house in secure in the knowledge that we're not going to get patronised. The person who I encounter is not going to ignore me completely and speak to my PA. That the taxi driver isn't going to uh, uh, start a conversation along the lines of, so what's your problem then? To which my answer generally is, well, right now it's you, actually. Um, but it's that kind of thing. It's those sorts of day-to-day -day knocks. You know, sometimes disabled people are thought of as weak and vulnerable. I can tell you, we have to be as tough as old boots to deal with those sorts of knocks. So those are some of the things that are going to have to change if we're really going to deliver on human rights for disabled people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I believe we've got comments and questions for the panel online. I'm getting technical here. It's quite exciting for me. Um, does it come up on the screen? Do these things come Sorry? I'll just read them out. You're just going to read them out? I'm not very technical. <laughs> I was expecting things on screens. Well, there we are. You're going to read them out. Could we have some questions then, please? Sure. So we've had loads of questions coming in on the Scottish Parliament's social media channels using the hashtag rights takeover. Um, so thank you to everybody that has contributed so far. Uh, here's one from Lorraine on Twitter on the topic of nursing. Uh, why don't the new education standards for nursing qualification include and embed a rights-based approach and learning about ageing? 
And uh, there's some more questions I'll just well, that's throw one. out. Give us or a do couple. Give us okay, a couple. Okay, sure. So, so the, the other hot topic, of course... Um, I don't mean because he's old. Be just <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. He's younger uh, than me, so I can see that. Yes, what's uh, the next one? Brexit is coming up quite a lot. Um, I'll sort of summarise a couple of points. So if Brexit goes ahead, how will this affect my German girlfriend living and working in the UK? How will Scotland ensure our continued commitment to human rights post-Brexit? That's from... Hazel King on Facebook. What will happen with our human rights if we leave the European Union? That's uh, Lynn Finlayson on Facebook. And lastly, just a comment from Neil on Facebook saying, Brexit puts in jeopardy UK citizens' protection from the critically important European Charter of Fundamental Rights, including Chapter 1 on Dignity. So Brexit and with training of the nursing profession at large about how, how older people are treated and so on. That's right. right. Who's taking what? You're going to take the one in ageing, are you? Yeah. There not. we <laughs> are. I gave you the build-up. Right, on you go. Uh, the, the new nursing standards are created by a body called the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Uh, I think a number of us in presenting evidence to their development said that we needed to prioritise human rights. In Scotland, we've gone a long way to establish a set of standards in health and social care which are embedding human rights at the heart. It's a pity that's not happened. However, I, I, I think, and, and I would never speak on behalf of the nursing profession, but anybody who knows good care, good nursing, recognises that that can only be delivered from a rights-based perspective. And it would be good specifically to see a greater emphasis on ageing, because I've got a concern that increasingly we are becoming a more ageist and a more age-discriminatory society. And if I can tie that with Brexit, I find it an unacceptable, and I was with people who came from diverse perspectives around the Brexit discussion and debate last week at a conference, but who described themselves as old. I find it's unacceptable that we fall back into easy stereotypes, saying that people, because they are of a certain age, said this, believe that, consider and want one area and one view. We have to be very careful that as we move through very challenging times around Brexit, that we don't fall foul of easy stereotypes which would actually have more destruction than we can possibly imagine even Brexit might have. So we have to be inclusive and human rights is a vehicle for enabling that both in terms of nursing practice but also in terms of our response around Brexit. Do you want to say? Yeah. You're nodding there, Yam. Yeah. Um, I, just to the question regarding Brexit and the, the worry um, post-Brexit for, for that individual, um, it's something, it, I'm also in capacity of chairman, um, acting chairman of Romano Love in Glasgow and we support the, the Roma community. Um, and Brexit again is something which the Roma community are very, very worried about um, with deportations ongoing as well. Um, so it's something which I, I share from that regard. Um, for me, I think that the Scottish Government needs to take a very firm stance um, They've taken a quite an ambiguous stance so far um, in saying that they would support um, post-Brexit these communities, but I think they need to be very firm. Um, they need to stand up and commit and ensure that they will support um, these communities um, post-Brexit to avoid further marginalisation and further division in society. Because currently there isn't enough um, security around the Scottish Government's position right now. There isn't enough security for these people who come March, they don't know whether they're going to be here or not. So I do share that frustration, and I think we need action from the government. I saw, I saw the minister taking notes. Very good. There, yes. <laughs> nodding at me, yes. Do you wish to make a comment? Very briefly, I think, I think that the implications of Brexit are going to have very significant implications, um, not for just disabled people, but for a wide range of people in terms of loss of rights. Um, but it will be both direct and indirect implications. For example, in the social care field and the health field, there are going to be real workforce implications because we rely on people to provide, um, um, to come in and be part of the social care and health care workforce. But I think really what's fundamental here is we've kind of lost sight of why international bodies, whether it's human rights bodies or European Union, are so incredibly important uh, when it comes to holding governments to account. Because if competitive edge 
is to be based on things like throwing out workers' rights and equality rights, about reducing food standards and, and, and climate standards, then I, for one, have no problem with uh, limiting sovereignty. Because I think the whole ethos, the whole point of human rights, where it came from, was about protecting individuals from the damage that states can do to their own citizens. That's where it came from. And just looking around us now, we can see it so, so starkly in the implications of our universal credit and so on. And it's tough, it's really difficult for individuals to hold governments to account. Even where the, 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 the law is there and you have meaningful rights, governments don't have to take... In fact, we've seen the UK government totally ignore the findings of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. They condemned them for systematic violations, grave and systematic violations of disabled people's human rights. They condemned them for creating a human catastrophe to precisely no effect whatsoever. So we need powerful institutions and, and we need those at international level because for individuals to protect themselves against some of the damage that governments can do requires that. And, and that is the sort of thing that we start to risk losing when we start dismantling these European and international structures. And I don't know that people understand that, and I don't know that they understand where human rights came from and why, therefore, it is so significant if we start losing the protections we have. The protections are not great. The protections need to be made much stronger. But there is, we have a lot to lose here. Uh, thank you. I'm going to take two people who will be waiting patiently to ask questions from the floor, then I'll come back. Have you still got some more on your whizzy thing, right? Um, it's a technical term, the whizzy thing. Um, could I ask you, please, Lady in the Purple, and then the gentleman to your left after that? Just one after the other, ask your questions. Hi, my name's Beverly, and I'm here today because I think of myself as an activist for human rights. And this came about because I was actually a patient in a psychiatric hospital, and I was actually had psychological abuse from members of staff. Now, I'm actually finding it very difficult, A, to be believed, and B, to get any justice to take this matter forward. I've tried many avenues, and I always end up getting the door slammed in my face. And I think it's appalling, as we, we hear today, it particularly pertains to, to marginalised groups where, where rights, where human rights are, 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 are never adhered to. And, you know, I'm so glad to be here today to celebrate this wonderful, glorious day, but particularly to have the chance to see, I think it's shocking in the 21st century that patients with mental health or any vulnerable patients or anybody is in receipt of abuse. When, when, when you're supposed to be looked after. I spent nearly 30 years as a nurse myself. I worked in coronary care and then intensive care. And when I became ill, I have been appalled at the treatment that I have received. And worse so because of the stigma, the stigma of the people that are working in mental health services. It's worse than the general public. And it needs to be, there needs to be an investigation into mental health services in Scotland and in the UK, because I know I'm not the only one that's in, been in receipt of abuse. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the gentleman who well, comments on that from the panel. Thank you. Uh, hello. My name is Sandy Taylor. I am the Scottish representative for the National Federation of the Blind of the UK, and also a member of Inclusion Scotland, by the way. Uh, I recall the Equality Minister in her previous role championed the rights of travelling people and I followed that quite a lot. I would like to ask the Scottish Government to appoint a champion for disabled people to uphold their rights. I refer in particular to shared space schemes in towns which exclude many hundreds of elderly and disabled people. And I come from Kirkintilloch, where, for those of you who don't know, shared space is where they remove or reduce the height of curbs, take, take away controlled crossings and traffic lights, and make towns like Kirkintilloch a no-go area for disabled people. 
Also, in the UK government have called a halt to all new shared space schemes in England. Sadly, the Scottish Government haven't done the same in Scotland, which means that these, these schemes are still going ahead all over the country. A scheme proposed for Inverness, for instance. In Glasgow, cycle lanes are being put in alongside pavements with no proper segregation between the two. And blind and uh, disabled people have to cross cycle lanes to get to and from bus stops. A, a champion for disabled people would be a big step forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Now, there's nobody from the government on the panel, but I know that the government's represented here, so obviously listening. Uh, can I ask if members who want to comment on any of these points or will I take more questions from the web? Like yes, Sally, yes, point. of course. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I would say that a, 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 we do need a champion for disabled people, but it needs to be somebody who's got some power to make things happen because that isn't always the case with champions. But even more importantly than having a champion for disabled people, I think it's about understanding that everybody, and particularly disabled people themselves, need to become champions. Every time, as a disabled person, somebody, you encounter negative attitudes, you encounter things like the shared space scheme, which you very rightly highlight, is a, is a, is a kind of, actually, it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that that's going to be a problem? How come it's still happening? I really wish I knew the answer to that. But if we, if we as disabled people challenge injustice, challenge discrimination, challenge the abuse of our human rights every time it happens, then gradually you start chipping away. But we can't do it on our own. That's why everybody needs to be becoming aware of this, becoming aware to be, of questioning the barriers. The point about institutions, Disabled people, as much as possible, should not be in institutions. Same with older people, I would suggest. Because once you're in institutions, that's a closed environment and the risks are self-evident. So I think you raise an incredibly important point and that's why independent living is so important. It's about people having choice and control and the support that they need to live their own lives as they wish, where they want to. So yes, very important points. Amal, because the mental health issues research. Thank you so much um, for sharing that and uh, I know so many people who have experienced exactly what you're saying and one example I can give um, is, is from a, a woman um, who's, who's an asylum seeker and she went to her doctor, her GP and uh, she had explained that she was uh, suffering from depression and she really wanted support um, and this woman comes from a particular uh, faith and the doctor also happened to share the same faith and he basically said to her well if your faith was strong enough you wouldn't be suffering from depression. And she was so scared to do anything about that because she thought it was going to backfire on her. So as you said, the stigma uh, on mental health is, is so extreme and so many people are so scared to do anything about it. And I, I don't think we, we hold staff accountable for mistreating people. So thank you so much for sharing what you said because I know so many people do and continue the fight. Thank you. I'm just going to take a, a few more comments from our webby thingy people. <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm aware we're just about out of time, so I'll just leave it for to one question this time. Uh, what is being done to prevent violations of Article 3, which is about prohibiting torture, of the, Uni of the European Convention on Human Rights in prisons? Are we talking UK prisons or prisons internationally? Or? They specified UK. In UK prisons. Mm. Right, anybody want to comment on that? I can't, I'm not in a position to comment on that explicitly, but I can say in terms of torture, um, I think people need, need to reframe what they perceive when they first hear the word torture. And actually, it's, uh, it happens uh, almost on a daily basis, and it actually happens in Scotland as well. Um, you know, I mentioned the work that, that myself and others do supporting the Roma community, um, and there is some um, anecdotal evidence which would tend to support um, building up uh, um, torture actually towards Roma people um, within Scotland um, and again we're working to to put that across to the government and we hope that the government would take a firm stance on that but I do think that it's valuable to reframe how we initially perceive torture. I'll take a, I'll take because it's a, we're running out of time just take a quick comment from everybody in that running right along so do you want to go first or then I come to yeah, uh, um, then to Sally. You know, I, I've I attended a phenomenal seminar recently on degrading treatment at Strathclyde University 
and that made me as an individual rethink what I meant by degrading treatment. And I think we have to see ourselves, each one, as capable of treating another in a manner which limits their dignity, which removes their individuality. And then we begin to reorientate ourselves. So is the way in which we treat the homeless degrading? Is the way in which we treat older individuals who are not adequately supported living their lives with dementia? Is that degrading? Is the way in which we treat individuals whose first language is not English and somehow or other limit their opportunity. And so it was, you know, for, for me culturally, it was fantastic to hear Gaelic spoken here in this human rights debate, because I belong to a family where just one generation ago, the speaking of Gaelic by my mother resulted in her ostracism and her discipline because she used a language which didn't fit in. So degrading needs to be, yes, understood in its high level in terms of Article 3, but we also need to think about what does degrading mean for ordinary citizens, and then we might get closer to understanding what human rights means for them. I'll come to you, Sally, then I'll finish off with you, Amal. Sally? Um, in many ways, I don't have much to add. I agree that it is about totally rethinking what we mean by degrading treatment, um, what dignity and respect really mean and also the extent to which people and we've already highlighted issues within institutions we've um, already talked about the importance of people being able to speak for themselves about people disabled people being ignored people refusing to make eye contact denying effectively denying your existence and talking to the people with you there's so much about this and this isn't to trivialize it because the impact can be very significant and it can be long-standing in terms of people's erosion of confidence, in terms of their absorbing really negative attitudes and blaming themselves for their own situation. Uh, and, and so there's a great deal that we need to do to rethink what this really means and to be alert to where this is happening and the many, many different ways in which it can find expression. Amal. When I hear the word uh, degrading, I think about all the people who are uh, sent to detention centers all over the UK who are um, basically detained indefinitely. So there's no time limit for asylum seekers who are being sent to detention centers. And when I think of that, I think you know, the, the kind of lack of uh, human rights and, and you know, human rights violations that are, are being caused. And it's almost as if asylum seekers are not people and they don't, you know, human rights don't, uh, Fall, you know, don't fall for them kind of thing. And it, it's, it's really shocking that it's still happening. And a lot needs to be done. As human beings, uh, I believe that we have a role and responsibility and a duty to stand up for what's right. And I also believe that it's our character that defines us, not where we come from or what you know, gender we are and so on and so forth. We're all human at the end of the day. Well, I know there's lots of other questions perhaps to ask, but we've run out of time, but I have to thank you all for your questions online and uh, here in the chamber. But I'd like you most of all to thank our panelists uh, for, for answering your questions. If you'd show your thanks them. <laughs>